I don't really care about this polygraph test. I mean, that's, that's secondary here. I feel about letting Elizabeth's soul rest in peace. I honestly don't believe that that can be done until everything's resolved. I just feel like I'm stuck now. There's no way I can resolve it. As far as with the police, I can't confess but I don't know exactly how she was killed. I don't want to confess to them because they didn't do it. What am I supposed to do? Early on the morning of March 26, 1990, Elizabeth McIntosh was murdered in the chapel bathroom on the campus of Covenant Theological Seminary in Crevecourt, Missouri, an affluent suburb of St. Louis. She was a 50-year-old student and a Scottish native. There were no witnesses, and there's virtually no physical evidence linking anyone to the crime scene. Police were convinced that the killer must have been someone Elizabeth knew, someone else on campus. They looked at several students who went on to become pastors and ministers at churches across the country, but no one was ever charged or arrested. Many of the people involved in this story have deep ties to the seminary, including myself. You'll hear more from me in future episodes. But as we tried to get more people to talk about Elizabeth and her death and what happened after, we encountered a lot of resistance. There's a sense of not wanting to commit what they call a ninth commandment violation. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, or drag up unverified rumors, or meddle in a police investigation, or tarnish the reputation of whatever institution you represent. For some of the people involved, this was the most traumatic event of their lives. Other people have wanted to talk about Elizabeth, but have never been sure how. One of Aesop's fables is about a group of mice that have a plan to put a bell on the cat so they can hear it coming in time to get away. All the mice agree it's a great plan, but an old mouse speaks up and says, let me ask one question, who will bell the cat? The lesson at the end of the fable says this, it's one thing to say that something should be done, but quite a different matter to do it. So we're trying to do it. This first episode is an effort not only to start telling Elizabeth's story, but to open an avenue where other people feel safe telling theirs. We think that by getting as many people as possible to talk openly about their experiences, we might be able to turn over some stones that haven't been fully explored yet. And over the last 33 years, some mistakes have been made on all sides of this case. But how can we learn what to do differently next time and right some of those wrongs if we don't speak honestly about what happened? We want everyone to have the opportunity to tell their side of the story in their own words. We're almost certainly not going to solve the case through this series, nor are we trying to. But we can keep Elizabeth's memory alive, and we can tell her story in a way that hasn't been told before. So join us, whether as a listener or as someone who might have their own part of this story to tell. I'm TJ Ingracia. And I'm Ruth Servan-Smith. This is True Believer, The Unsolved Murder of Elizabeth McIntosh. Episode 1, God Only Knows the Answer. My name is Diane Preston. I am here because I knew Liz. We want to start with some background on Elizabeth, and there's almost no better person still alive to do that than Diane Preston. We'll be spending an entire episode down the road with people who knew Elizabeth telling stories about her, including Diane again. But this will start to give you a feel for who Elizabeth was. Not only did Diane know Elizabeth, she also worked at Covenant Seminary for over 30 years. So she has an interesting perspective on what I call PCA world. The PCA, or Presbyterian Church in America, is the Christian denomination that Covenant is affiliated with. The history and politics and nuances of the PCA play a big role in this story, but that's a future episode. And one point of clarification here for anyone not familiar with what a seminary actually is, some Christian churches and denominations require their pastors to be formally trained on how to preach and understand the Bible. And they get that training at a seminary. You can think of it kind of like postgraduate Jesus school. Anyway, here's Diane talking about how she first met Elizabeth sometime in the mid 1980s. I was a short-term missionary in England for two and a half years and her pastor and I were friends and she was looking at seminary and he had done a D-men at Covenant. So he was trying to get her to look at Covenant. 
So he asked me to talk with her and tell her about Covenant and about St. Louis. So that's how we met, and I got together with her a few times in England, and then she came over here as a student. Her father was the principal of the Free Church College in Edinburgh. That's British speak for the president of the Free Church Seminary in Edinburgh. And he was the mentor for the pastor I worked for, who did his MDiv at the Free Church College. So there were lots of connections. Liz was a sister in England, which is a nurse. I think she was like a head charged nurse or something. Um, had been a sister for a long time at one of the big hospitals in London. Very organized in the nicest possible way, very bossy, um, <laughs> which you have to do to do that job. But she knew what she wanted, and she made sure it happened. So, like, one time I went over there ostensibly to tell her about Covenant. She said, why don't you come and stay the weekend with me? So I said, okay, fine. So I go over, but she had other plans, and they were very kind. Her other plans were, Diane needs a break, and I'm going to give it to her. So she had all these soaps and lotions and, I mean, every kind of pampering stuff you can imagine. And that's all we did all weekend because she wasn't going to talk business. That was not her plan. So very kind, very giving, but not bashful at all about telling you what she thought should happen. Um, (laughs) I know the gal that she was roommates with Um, was dating a guy who is still in St. Louis, and Liz didn't think it was a good thing. And she had told Chris, in no uncertain terms, she thought it was a very bad match. (laughs) That doesn't surprise me at all, because that's who she was, you know. Another person who knew Elizabeth well was Professor Jerem Bars. Like Diane, Jerem worked at Covenant for over 30 years and had also met Elizabeth in England prior to her coming to the U.S. to study. Here's him talking about having Elizabeth as a student in his classes. Yeah, I would say she's very bright, very serious about ideas. Uh, She asked outstanding questions. You know, she, she was a serious student, so she took her questions very seriously and she wanted really adequate answers. She wasn't satisfied with just a kind of brush off. And sadly, many male teachers in the churches treat women as kind of second-class students. I would say she didn't suffer fools lightly. You know, whether that fool was a fellow student or even a pastor or teacher, she said what she thought very plainly. So I think that some men found that a challenge. I'm sure some of her fellow students. uh, I don't remember any of my colleagues finding her a challenge. She was greatly respected and loved by people. But she was serious and she had strong ideas. So TJ, I was on the campus this week, okay? And for this first day of orientation, I'm there with maybe 15 other people with PCA connections. And uh, this woman asks an individual on faculty, is this place safe? Is it safe for a woman to be in? And he said, well, you do know there's an unsolved murder there. This is about five minutes into the dinner. I kid you not. (laughs) Kim told me, don't talk about it. Five minutes into the dinner, he says, you do know there's a murder here. And I said, oh, I'm very, very well aware. Next thing you know, I'm being walked into the chapel Walk down the stairs, and I stood at the site. That's Kyle Hackman. We've been friends since sixth grade when we both attended Living Word Christian School together in St. Charles, which is the next county over from St. Louis. Today, he pastors a PCA church in Toronto, and he's the one that introduced me to Elizabeth's case. The first thing to know about me is that I went to a private Christian school my whole childhood, first at Living Word, where I met Kyle, then starting in seventh grade at Christian High School. Which one? Just Christian High School, or CHS as most of us refer to it. 
Another friend that went to CHS with Kyle and me is Andrew Stout. Actually, I've known Stout since first grade, and that's what everyone calls him. He's a graduate from Covenant, and until very recently, he was also on staff there. In the summer of 2022, Kyle was back in St. Louis for some PCA business on the Covenant campus, so he and Stout and I had a last-minute get-together, and we sort of impromptu decided to record everything we knew about the case up to that point. That last part, where I said, up to that point, is going to be a recurring theme through this series. Today, we know exponentially more about the case than we did when we recorded what you'll hear in this episode. I've actually had to cut a lot of it out because we were so wrong about so many things. But I want to start the series here because I think this conversation gives a good feel for what's been generally known about the case over the years. And it sets the stage for a lot of the key players that we'll talk more about in future episodes. On that point, you're going to hear a lot of names and dates and places throughout this episode. We've tried to craft a coherent narrative that sets the stage for the rest of the series, but there's no getting around it. This is a long and complicated story. So I guess what I'm saying is, hang in there with us. One last thing. After this initial conversation, Ruth and I eventually did a follow-up interview with Kyle to get some clarity on certain parts of his story. And you'll hear some of both recordings in this episode. That's why his audio might sound a little different in some places. Okay. Back to that night with Kyle and Stout, as we talked about some of the details of the murder, fuzzy as they were at the time. All of my facts are slightly off. Like it's, I'm in, it was exactly even the date, like it was 1990. Was it March of 1990? March 26, 1990. Okay. Okay. So March 26, 1990, there, uh, there was a murder on campus at Covenant Seminary. The woman that was killed was Elizabeth McIntosh. And she was like in her 40s? She was in her 50s. She was 50. Okay, she was 50. She was found dead in the uh, men's bathroom in the basement of Rayburn Chapel on campus. And that's about all that was publicly released for a while. I mean, more details about her. She's 50, but she's Scottish. She's from Edinburgh. Had a career as a nurse, was coming to do She was a counseling student, I believe. Yeah. And her father is one of the most famous Scottish ministers. He was a minister of the Free Church of Scotland, which... Even he was among the moderator of the, the moderator, sorry, right? yeah, that was, yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, even amongst our high school friends, as we talk about it, no, no one saw that as like a big deal. But I think when, in Presbyterian circles, and then now also living in Canada, where you understand something of like a national church and something of the decorum that comes with these prestigious appointments, that that's no small deal. That was that's a pretty a reputable man. Uh, you don't get that easily. It's, it's sort of like being an archbishop, as close as you could get in the Presbyterian circles. So, And how was she murdered? Yeah, all that was initially re- released was that she was strangled and stabbed. That was all that was released in the papers, unless I'm missing some papers as I dug them up. Later, we find that it was scissors, and um, speaker wire was used to kind of tie her body up to the stall. Yes, a student finds it, and the student finds it. I'm so sorry. She's a dead woman. Now, this is part of the story that I will get at times get a bit frustrated, even with myself. Um, you know, it is fun. To, these murder mysteries are fun, but this is a real woman that didn't have anyone on the ground to advocate for her. She's an immigrant, even if she's an immigrant with a visible majority. She still doesn't under her family doesn't understand how to navigate the system. And she was here alone. She no family. Yeah, here. yeah. Single woman. Like I just the whole thing just makes me sick to my stomach that um, people could sleep without. You know, wanting to find the solution to this thing. Um, so she, her body's found by these guys unlocking the door, okay? I know one of them who we tried to get to talk through a friend, through me, an intermediary. I don't personally know him. So he finds the body. My understanding is he runs to the, at the time I think it was the Dean of Students, Dr. Chaffel, to, um, to report this because there's no cell phones at the time, right? And so she, he runs to his office to say, what do we do? And so my understanding is though, from this point, the cops come in, uh, there is newspaper clippings that I have access to of, you know, photos of the students being interviewed there, which again, like, I don't know what kind of care these students got who were exposed to this. It's crazy to think even in 1990, we didn't think of re-traumatizing right. people the same way yeah. we do now. And I, my guess is that par- partially plays into the story a little bit too about yeah. why it's hard to get these people to talk and also why the interactions with the cops get a little bit rocky. Because if you're fairly traumatized, you feel falsely accused, um, but you don't know how to process it, it feels like the best thing to do is just ignore. 
That's the short version of what initially happened the day of the murder. We'll spend the next several episodes going into much more detail, but we felt it was important to at least give you a high-level sense of what happened. This isn't just a story about a murder. It's also the story of trying to tell that story. You can think of this series like two parallel tracks running at the same time. One is about a murder and the subsequent investigations, but the other is a story about those who have wrestled with how to handle Elizabeth's death and the ways in which her memory has essentially been erased, especially from Covenant's institutional memory. So now I want to switch tracks so you can hear a little bit about Kyle's journey through this case. And you'll hear from other pastors and people in the PCA later in the series who have been on that same journey. I first heard about the murder at Covenant Seminary in 2009 while I was taking a counseling class in seminary. The professor at the time shared a story about counseling somebody and giving a kind of stock confidentiality form to the individual. And in the midst of counseling this person, I think it was a couple, some details surfaced and the professor began to realize that the person across from her was likely the person who had committed the murder. And I don't remember much of the details about why confidentiality was important because my brain was fixated on the fact that there was a murder at Covenant Seminary. As someone who grew up outside of St. Louis, this I couldn't stop thinking about it. So this is in 2009. And the internet was not what it is today, and my sleuthing skills weren't as, as honed in as they are today, but I did immediately find, I was able to find some record of it. And that sort of began this back of my mind, uh, kind of thinking about it with some regularity and occasionally asking about it to other individuals who are at Covenant. Shortly after hearing about the murder, Kyle moved to Toronto to pastor a church. The PCA is much smaller in Canada. They call it the PCA, E-H question mark. And Covenant has historically been more connected to the PCA in the American South. For many years, the murder was on Kyle's mind, and he'd occasionally talk to other pastors about it. But two things happened in 2017 that led to Kyle getting more involved. He planted a new church and received a mysterious email. I planted the church in 2017, which meant I was fundraising prior to that, which meant I was networking with a lot more people. And it's amazing how often when you get together with especially younger pastors who know the story, they ask, start talking about it. Almost, it seems to me, almost everyone's curious about a couple of things. I mean, it's a murder, so everyone wants justice. I don't think that that should go unstated, but I think everyone is so curious about it because the, the big fishy thing is how quiet everyone is about it. There's no memorial. There's no plaque. Uh, there's no scholarship, you know, in the honor. There's no, and it's, it's pretend this didn't exist. And we live in a time and place where you just don't do that anymore. So there's a real conundrum in people's minds like, we don't do that with almost any other wrong we've done in our past, whether that be, you know, racism or, you know, any sort of sexual abuse thing. The goal is to expose it fairly quickly and publicly. But in this case, it's airtight, except for everyone knows a bit and piece of it that they want to know what piece someone else knows. It's always what's going on. For me, this was all my worlds colliding in a strange way because I did not go to Covenant, but I joined, ended up joining the PCA, getting ordained the PCA. But most of my experiences in the PCA have been in the North, where not a lot of people uh, are, have deep ties to Covenant. But you always kind of feel like an outsider, like that's the school you should have gone to. Right. If you did the right path, you would have gone there. So anyway, you always know these people, and you start hearing about the story. And then one other wrinkle in all this is uh, a lot of international students who end up in my church or in my, in my presbytery, they, they're international students, so they can't work anywhere except for on campus. And obviously, the easiest job is unlocking doors, security, etc. And they all tell the story, as was told to them, you know, through this oral tradition that's been passed on. That, and yeah, that makes sense. that part of the story is actually, is actually pretty unbelievable to hear them tell the story about the first time they heard it while they were walking, you know, through campus to make sure every door was locked. So uh, anyway, I had all these stories of, like, people in my presbytery that were interested in it. And then it was like the last link was as soon as the CHS guys got on it. I found in my notes exactly when I started thinking of coming to you guys about it. I, with many other ministers, received this email, exposed the darkness. 
doesn't go into my junk folder. It's from an individual. And in there, the email says, I want to bring to your attention some serious faults of the PCA. In fact, they're so dire that in 50 years' time, the PCA will no longer be recognizably reformed. It'll be proven that the PCA was only a carrier of its values for the time being, was never really the anchor. Okay, so this thing is, it's a crazy, crazy email. A lot of caps locks, a lot of dot, dot, dots, you know, kind of like a, it's a strange email. But in this email, the person writes, one of the most shocking occurrences in the history of the PCA, and really in all of modern church history, is the murder of Elizabeth McIntosh in the Chapel of Covenant Seminary in March of 1990 goes on to say, basically, God's judgment is on the PCA because we ha- harbor a murderer uh, in the denomination. And this was when a bunch of us start sending texts to each other, like, hey, did anyone else get this email? And, and it's like, why did you read it? You know, it's like, <laughs> well, you know, I couldn't stop reading it. And that is what actually set us off. And beca- a lot of us became obsessed with it. And then we found out that there were some older people who knew a couple more things and a lot of us who received that email, it started going crazy. So sorry to take you back on the time warp, but that email actually came out and it, it did cause a disturbance. All of us were sort of like, this is better than serial. This is better than any of the podcasts we've ever heard. This is an incredibly captivating story. And I, I do think as we were reflecting on this, we, we felt... It wasn't like a fun story, like we were sleuthers. There was like a moral obligation tied to it as well that that was almost immediately felt. And so there were discussions of, we have to tip off someone who can solve this. Like we have to, someone maybe, we have an obligation maybe to try to find somebody that can can dig into this. And there was a, it, sure it was like invigorating and people were sending messages back and forth and some of which were humorous. It also was incredibly serious because I think there was a kind of moral weightiness to the fact that this is our tribe and a lot of people on this thread went to this seminary and a lot of people trained with people who were at the seminary at the time who hypothetically could be the murderer. And this this the weight of it kind of changed you know, there were some jokes here or there, but more or less, this was a pretty weighty exchange for what, what previously was a pretty lighthearted group of, of pastors. You know, I did feel like I was learning about it for the first time too, because so many details were pouring out. But, you know, as I watched everyone, well, the collective thought, as I'm stumbling for my words here, I, I guess the collective feel of the room was, how do we not know about this? The exchanges sort of reflected this yes, this needs to be solved. Yes, this could be like, maybe we have the ability to solve it because of all of our mutual connections. But there was this question of like, this is crazy. And it was related to the fact that there was this feeling that we should know this. We, we should know some of these details. You know, this is, this is wild. That Christmas of 2017, Kyle came home to visit family. So a group of our high school friends got together to catch up. That was the first night we all talked about the murder together, and the first time I had ever heard about it, despite my wife and dad having both graduated from Covenant prior to that. Here's Stout talking about our conversation that night. I think you brought it up, the murder at Covenant, and I said I was DMing on Twitter with a journalist who was asking about it on, you know, like, put out a tweet saying, if you were at Covenant from 1990 and 91 or something, you know, some gave some date And that range. happened to be a congregant of mine. Right, exactly. And I was like, <laughs> I, I ex- had an exchange with this guy, and you're like, he's in my congregation, right? He, yes. So he's a congregant that just gets really fixated on strange topics. He kind of has another job. He's not, he, I think he would like to be a full-time journalist, but yeah. uh, well, it's kind of like a dog on a bone, but no one would talk. And he had some credentials. He had published some pretty big stories. I forget. Uh, he was inside Bethel, Bethel Church out in Reading. He had yeah, done yeah, kind yeah. of an right. insider report that was very well received. And so he had some credentials, at least within the Christian community, that would, I think would lend him to believe he would get a hearing about wanting to cover the story. And he hit brick wall after brick wall after brick wall. So I bring it up actually that night, not knowing he had reached out to yeah. you. Because I actually had kept an arm's length distance. At the time, I was just curious about it, but I knew nothing. Okay, so the first time I heard about it, I had been a student at Covenant from 2008 to 2010. I had never heard anything about a murder. I hadn't even heard it alluded to. I'd heard nothing. I was working at St. Charles Community College. One of the campus policemen 
was George Hodak, and I would see him, you know, on Wednesday nights. He'd come by the library and kind of hang out and talk for a little bit. We were talking about whatever, and some, it came up that I went to Covenant, and he goes, oh, so you know about the murder. I said, no, I had no idea about the murder. So I find out that he's a retired detective from the Creve Corps Police Department. One of the detectives working on that case and gives me kind of his whole story about it, which is very dramatic and very, like he tells it, he's very practiced in his telling It's a good cop story. It's a great cop story. It's a cop drinking story. When he tells it, it almost sounds like, you know, on some police procedural show, the cop telling about the cold case that haunts him and there's a flashback to, you know, 20 years before as he narrates over. Yeah. And so I think not long after that, I get in contact with Hodak. I think a tipping point. So you have all of these pastors who talk about it all the time and all of them have a different nugget and a different angle. So when you get together, you'd have something of a puzzle, but Hodak was the game changer when I LinkedIn messaged him and he was very curious that I was curious because I was ordained. It turned out like that was in his opinion, what he had not had, which was somebody who carried credentials in the denomination and um, someone on the inside. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, the way he perceives the seminary at the time his perception is they became unhelpful. And I think that actually that that actually is Covenant Seminary's perception is that it became, it became unwise to continue to be helpful with the path that was being taken by the police department. And so Hodak, though, I remember one day he asks, can I call you? And I mean, this is the moment where like, you know, the background music changes. And like, I remember like it was not in a good place. I, I was out in a, like a suburb pretty far out at a meeting. And I was like, yes. And, and he immediately like calls and I pulled over to a parking lot and it was freezing cold. It was the middle of winter. And I told him my hunch as to why I thought that there was log jam and why this, why possibly the seminary wasn't interested. And then he kept telling more. And he told a story that I've heard you tell as well about he's fixated on one person. Yeah. He, he, when I talked to him, he was convinced that of the two or three suspects that they had initially, he was convinced that one of the suspects was guilty and he go he tells in some detail like being in the interrogation room with that suspect and he know and this is where it sounds like a uh, police procedure where he, he identifies the moment in the interrogation where it turned and the guy clammed up and he knows what he should have done differently in that moment you know my understanding is there were three students that they were absolutely convinced one of these three had to do it and it seemed to many people that they were willing to ruin the life of two in the name of catching the third uh, in the way that they pursued this. I don't know if this is true or not. So I had only heard the stories probably of guys that had been somewhat traumatized laughing about it, telling particularly one of them, you know, stories about being a suspect and the silly police work that was done. Whenever it became to try to make those things more official, like tell me exactly what happened. We're thinking like there could be progress made on this. He clammed up. The other guys, I just became like, a rabid researcher about some of the funny stories that come up. I think I've shared these, like the police there trying to keep an eye on these boys and, you know, going to the library, just pulling down whatever book they could and pretending like they're just ordinary students there reading, but they're like accidentally pulled down like a dictionary, you know, like a Greek dictionary yeah. that they have like no <laughs> business reading. You know, I, I doubt that's real, but, yeah. but I think the point was they were just so obviously out of place on this very small campus at the time. I don't know how many students were there at the time in 1990. That'd be a good fact to, put it all in the perspective, but it's not yeah, a lot of students. Yeah. Three or 400? In the, t in the total student body in 1990. I thought it was even smaller than it that. It was probably smaller. Because faculty appointments, it's just a smaller faculty too. For what it's worth, the Covenant student directory for that year lists about 270 people between students, staff, and faculty. So, stat wasn't too far off. Seems like almost immediately they fixate on the guy who found Elizabeth. And it becomes pretty obvious he didn't do it. Uh, there's a variety of reasons, but um, he's, I think he's also very good. I mean, he, he's a successful pastor right now. So my guess is he's very clear communicator and he probably presented as someone who was sh in shock about this and not likely a suspect and could explain what happened in his day. So they kind of move on from him. There's a third student I've, I've, I know almost nothing about. And then the student who we'll, we'll call person A, um, that they really become fixated. Our Bible boy, we'll call him Bible boy, that they become fixated on him. Because of this altercation. Uh, because of this altercation. Yeah, that's it, actually, you know, in the police notes, they're trying to figure out, hey, who would, would anyone want to kill her? And that immediately they said, well, you know what? There was a really out of place, strange for a seminary work staff 
altercation that had to be documented. And uh, that becomes... And it was within a sh- relatively short uh, time believe, span of when I believe the it was occurred. Like, I believe it was like the day before. Oh, wow. Like okay. very I, close. I, I, yeah. Yeah, I like don't. very close. I don't have those details in front of me. I, I just remember it being about spend using too much of something or you know, a way of organizing something. It was something so petty. It was something where he was really like in in telling I remember Hodak kind of emphasizing just the, the dynamic between the two people. It's like, look, this is a younger guy who's in a supervisory position over this, you know, woman who's significantly older than him. And they just got into it over something about cleaning products or whatever. Hodak doesn't think he set out to kill her. Right. He thinks that the guy can't control his temper because he witnessed him being uncontrolled of his emotions and um, whether that be crying or panicking. And um, and that's what brought it to. So, I mean, the Creepport Police Department eventually invested money to see this guy. He's past, He pastors all over the United States at these smaller churches, and they would send cops there to spy on him, to take notes about what he's saying. You know, this individual, I, I don't know if he would talk. I mean, on YouTube, he's the one who has a... The uh, son. The son that has this that opera. You're like, wait a second, it's called Elizabeth, you know, and he hits that really high piercing note. You're like, holy cow, it's, it's basically an opera about how this woman changed his father's life, which changed his life. That to me is a story in a nutshell. Like I, I would love for someone to actually, if the cops were, I, I, I'm, I have a hunch that some of the police department might realize the story could end up being more about bad policing than right. it ends up being about a dirty seminary. Well, because or... that's what I mean. That is kind of the story publicly about it now. Outside of the seminary, is that there is like acknowledgement of mishandled evidence that made them unable to solve the case. Right, right, right. Okay, well, Hojack will definitely talk about that, and he's you know really you know angry about it. Insofar as there is anyone publicly outside of Covenant knows any details about the case, it seems like that is the story, is that the police botched it. Yeah, yeah. And maybe that's maybe that's just what it is. Well, you know, and then also, but, I think we've come a long way, but it's not justified the way they treated somebody who didn't do it. So no, no matter what, mm-hmm. someone who didn't do it really got treated right. in a way that I think police now would say is not justifiable Yeah. in terms of just assumed guilty Yeah. and yeah, yeah, treated yeah. as guilty until they could pr- prove themselves to be innocent and knowing that a young seminarian is not going to get lawyers. Um, you can right. understand why the seminary probably felt obligated to intervene. The post-dispatch very early on has an interview from the president, Paul Koistra, of the seminary at the time. He's, he reports that he's skeptical the police have the right suspect. And so, I mean, yeah. right away, it seems as though the seminary thinks you guys are on onto the wrong people. This, they, they're certain it was someone on campus. All these articles that where they're interviewing Harris, the guy who's the main uh, detective, the head detective on it, they keep saying over and over and over again that it's someone on campus. And I just think they got tunnel vision and they missed it. There was one other thing that Kyle brought up to Hodak that he thought the police may have overlooked. Elizabeth's upcoming transfer to Knox Theological Seminary in Florida. There's one detail that I interact with him about that I think he starts to understand that maybe there is people seeing this differently, and that is that she was transferring to Knox Seminary. She may have been doing an internship at Knox Seminary, but she was transferring, not she, Elizabeth was transferring. And to me, this was no small detail. And so this is where I started uh, trying to figure out who her pastor was. I tried to figure out who was involved in her life at the school. And this is where I explained to Hodak that there was this sort of rift in Covenant Seminary. And Hodak's understanding was that Knox was more prestigious. It was like a real counseling degree and Covenant was more like a Christian sort of second rate degree. And he thought that this is possibly why someone murdered her because she said, I'm going to get a real degree. I'm out of this place. And then the person murders her. And I tried to explain to him that it was actually maybe quite the opposite. It was like, you know, a startup school that's even more conservative. 
And I also pointed out to him that there were people who were getting appointments to that school at the same time. And I thought there might be some connection between all these things. I mean, I, I say I, I'm acting now like I said I might. TJ probably was talking to me around this time and he would know. I was certain I had solved it at this point. Like I was confident because I had put some pieces together that hadn't been put together, at least as far as I could tell from Hodak. Not only was Knox Seminary a more conservative startup school, it was started largely as a breakoff from Covenant, which was in a pretty precarious position in the late 1980s. The president at the time, Paul Koistra, had been brought in with a mission, either fix the problems at the seminary or shut it down. And the Knox breakoff was a big part of that. We'll talk more about it in a future episode. You know, I guess maybe if you are keeping a record, it is intriguing. I, my conscience is really torn because in one sense, I think I want this solved for the sake of this woman, but also actually for the sake of possibly Bible Boy if he didn't do it. And his son, who we you see online, is obviously still harmed by this. And so I think, you know, I want to talk about this thing. I want to shoot my mouth about it. I want people to have to fess up and tell their side of the story. I want this, the truth to surface. But then also you get to this place where you know, you realize like you're up against a lot of things. Cops don't like being told they might, the detectives don't like being told that they might miss something. And I, like, I've already experienced that pretty drastically. There's also this big driving question is why doesn't Covenant want to talk about it? That's a huge question for me. You've alluded to several times, why is Covenant not talking about it? Why are they? So what's the Covenant angle here? I don't have as many ins into Covenant Seminary, but there is another guy that is in with Covenant Seminary who was also very obsessed with the case, who had spent some time trying to say, uh, why, why won't we talk about this? Why, why shouldn't we be out? And he actually had the ability to kind of get to the, get to the higher-ups and ask the question. His impression was, Covenant does not want to talk about this. It wasn't even the thing like, oh, let's go have a beer, we'll talk about it then. We just publicly don't want to talk about it. It was like, this messed them up. And uh, you, you can even find quotes in the paper where they're basically saying, hey, like, our students have to get on with life. Uh, it's, it, you know, this was just obsessive in the news. A uh, 50-year-old sort of white Scottish woman at a very rich part of the city. First off, they got the heat from it because of the 2020 30-year anniversary. And that actually came at a horrible time if you're trying to keep it quiet. It's during COVID when all of us were online. It was very widely circulated amongst PCA ministers and elders and members and St. Louis people. So I think that there's some pressure there. And then there's a new president. He's got to play his hand. You know, I, I would have liked to make a case to him, though, that I think it's in the seminary's best interest to find a neutral party to tell the story, to find someone who's not a police officer, but who's also not tied to the seminary to tell the story. And uh, I really think it's in Covenant's best interest, but I've not had those direct conversations because I hope to have a job later in my life. And uh, I have family ties to this part of, you know, St. Louis, and I w- might have to come back at some point. And I don't want to be persona non grata. <laughs> I don't want to be uh, the most hated man whose exile in Canada lasts forever. Sometimes I joke that Kyle could always leave the PCA, come back home to St. Charles, and just start a non-denominational church. It's a joke because in St. Charles, there's about two churches for every one person. Seriously, there's a lot of churches. I would like to hear Covenant say, and even if they say, you know, hindsight being 2020, it didn't look good how we did it. Right. But I would like to hear them say, here's why we thought they had the wrong guy. So I think the new president has to make a decision. Yeah. of how do I handle this? Which, like, in one sense, I think there is some pressure from at least younger guys like me saying, I understand that doesn't bring good attention to your institution, right. but a woman's debt. Also, it did happen, so that's a fact. It, it, it's There's no question about, like, this. there was a murder that happened on your campus. It is unsolved. Of course you don't want the publicity, but what has it already done to you as an institution, and what would it do to you if you did anything but uh, work in every way you could to help bring justice in the situation. I still think they had a good chance to get out ahead of this thing. I, re- sure. I really yeah. do. And, and and not as a PR move, but actually saying, if their opinion is similar to mine, that the cops got fixated on the wrong person, get out ahead of this thing and contact a neutral party and say, we're willing to talk for the sake of solving this murder. Not for the sake of, you know, a fun story that's going to get a lot of clicks, 
but we're willing to talk for the sake of solving this murder. I, I think that that preemptive move would have been a great PR move. But again, I, I'm also noticing in this whole thing, guys under 40 think way differently about this than guys over 40. Yeah, if you, you have a whole, you know, generation now of people who have gone through the seminary and the fact that they haven't heard about it, it's not like someone just forgot to mention it. I dedicated some years to this institution, trusted my education to them and all that, and then they don't say anything about this. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense that you've got a bunch of PCA pastors of a certain age that are up in arms about it. Yeah, but they're not they're not angry in the sense that they realize there's not much right. you could have done right. And, and sometimes it's all loss. It's all managing damage. But it's a woman. She's single. I think there's also a sensitivity where it's like, it's a duty. You have a duty, and and so part and part of why I got obsessed with covenant not advocating for her because you would think the institution would see it as its duty to advocate for us. I thought, what kind of suspect would put the seminary in a situation where they couldn't advocate? Yeah, that that actually was part of my theory too. I mean, that's part of why I got there are the rabbit hole I went down is, you know, there's a couple of chess moves that have been set up here so that someone feels pinned. You know, they feel pinned. They have to choose which way they're going to lose a piece, and they're trying to manage damage control. They're not actually trying to make any forward movement. But you should be advocating for the justice of this woman. How could you get pinned? How could you get trapped? And you're saying the seminary got trapped. I think the tra seminary was in a situation that they defend themselves, they lose. They don't defend themselves, they lose. They put forward who they think did it, they lose. They keep their mouth shut, they lose. And so they chose... What I'm, what the conclusion that I also have kind of come to, which was state your peace with the people who have the right and authority to do this thing. We don't live in the wild, wild west. And so because of that, make your case to the people who have the power to actually do something. If they, they don't do anything with it. Meaning the police. The police, yeah. If they don't do anything with it, if they don't think hard about some of these details about this network that she was involved in and about this seminary transfer, if they think this is inconsequential and I can't convince them, well, at this point, then there's not much beneficial I can do because if I say you know and I thought about this at one point actually I thought I'm, I'm gonna make a podcast and I'm just gonna unveil who I think did it but it doesn't actually help because it doesn't close the case and in fact I don't have access to everything so I could slander someone's name all to find out they had a whole you know whole list of reasons why I was wrong but what's a bummer is I feel like it's come to the place where they need to collaborate they need to collaborate the seminary needs to collaborate with the police with interested uh, ministers with sort of the extended network, they need to actually call a you know a, a ceasefire in some senses and, may, and say some mea culpas, both parties, and find a way to move forward to get justice for this woman. There's significant risk for each in being in like being fully transparent about it because Creve Court PD already does look bad and could look a lot worse if you know you really uncover you know significant mishandling of evidence or whatever and, and covenant, covenant has tons i mean i'm actually pretty confident actually the more i've kind of got a chance to talk about conclusion i've come to i'm pretty confident the cops have heard very clearly probably my guess is maybe even from the seminary my view and uh, I, what i'm calling my view and I, I i don't think the cops have time or day for it you can hear the conflict within kyle and that conflict exists in a lot of other PCA pastors and members as well. But obviously, Kyle decided it was worth it to talk publicly about the murder. Here, he explains why. What really tipped the scales and really made me willing to talk to TJ in that first time we discussed, even though there's great trepidation that I might find myself in trouble about it, was, yes, there is a real risk that I could give innuendos and hints as to who I think did it and cause great harm to someone's reputation and really put it out a situation uh, where where I am, you know, I am liable for my words that I'll have to own up to. At the same time, I think there's the possibility of maybe restoring relationships and restoring trust and maybe even hope for some people whose lives have been very much devastated by the cloud of knowing that, that someone thinks they might have committed the murder. And so part of closing the case to me that was exciting is, by and large, there's people who don't talk about this other than when they're kind of joking, when they've had a drink or two, they might sort of share a story, people who are there. But I think because it's unsolved, they, there's still this kind of cloud that someone might think they did it. There, it's not been solved. They could be accused. And that's a huge weight to bear. And part of pushing the case forward would be trying to lift that weight off some people's shoulders if I could, you know, prove that someone did it. 
is there some hope that maybe it's been enough time where there's enough new people involved and all the old people who were there are now gone who I, are invested in saying this doesn't implicate me directly so i don't have the vested interest in like suppressing it or not talking about it right have we reached that critical mass you think or is it still no not yet no and i, and I fear we might not uh i feel it, it, it might be a, a mystery and murder that dies you know, in, in a mysterious way, it's hard for me to have peace and the Lord will have to judge on the last day on this one. But uh, the reason being, of various suspects that it could be, they have relatives and friends and people who they've made big impacts on all over. And um, to, to begin to surface these accusations, then in some senses impact someone who had very little personal relationships with who you think the killer might be but has a very glorious memory of them because of the way death works. You know, we, were, we, we honor the dead and we remember what was good about the dead. And sure, we remember they were human like us with their foibles and problems. But by and large, what, what we pass on is those good things. And that Don't get too specific about what the foibles or problems might be. Cause yeah, that's, you know. yeah, in one sense. Yeah, and, and, and it's strange. And I don't know, maybe we'll become a more healthy society where it's like, and in some senses, it is properly honoring the dead that we don't that right. we properly remember them. But at the same time, I do hope my great-grandchildren hear mostly good stories about me. You know, I hope they know that I was a sinner just like they are, but I, I want them to remember some of the better things, that I solved a murder. <laughs> <laughs> so, what now? Well, to start, we've reached out to every single person you heard referenced in this episode, plus dozens more with information about Elizabeth, the police investigation into her murder, the environment of Covenant and the PCA, and other topics. Some we've talked to off the record, and some have agreed to be interviewed. In the episodes to come, you'll hear from them and the stories they have to tell. Before we wrap up, we wanted to address a statement put out by Covenant Seminary on December 5th in response to the trailer that we released for this series. We'll put a link to the statement in the show notes so you can read it for yourself, but the gist of it is that Covenant says it has always fully cooperated with the police and continues to fully cooperate. They're not participating in this podcast in order to, quote, leave the investigative work of this open case to law enforcement professionals, unquote. We've also heard through other sources that the current Covenant administration considers this project as primarily an anti-Covenant attack on conservative, complementarian, evangelical institutions. While we're not really interested in getting into a back and forth with Covenant Seminary about the merits of this series, we do think this is a good opportunity to address at least some of what we'll be talking about in the episodes to come. First and foremost, this project is not about trying to solve the murder of Elizabeth McIntosh, much to the disappointment of Kyle's future great-grandchildren. This is a legitimate, journalistic investigation into how people and institutions responded to a terrible crime. We've based our work directly on documented evidence, from written and recorded police investigation materials that they have provided us, internal documents from Covenant Seminary, documents we've obtained from other sources, and the interviews that people have given us. We've done this work because no public comprehensive record exists, and because we heard over and over again that people wanted to honor Elizabeth, clear away the rumors, and help the police in any way they can. In addition to interviews with dozens of people involved and invested in this case, in Covenant Seminary, and in the PCA, we also spoke with several former members of the Creve Corps Police Department, who worked the case both in 1990 and over the subsequent decades. As you'll hear in the coming episodes, they feel like Covenant was not always fully cooperative, in contrast to Covenant's statement. We've been in contact with the Creve Corps Police Department, and while they've been incredibly helpful in getting us access to the investigation materials, they declined to speak with us on the record. We've also made efforts, both directly and through intermediaries, to talk to the current Covenant administration, off the record, simply to explain this project to them and what our intentions are for it. And it's not like we're strangers off the street. Ruth and I both have deep ties to Covenant Seminary, but they refuse to meet or even to speak with us. Covenant's statement claims that speculation and innuendo about the facts surrounding Elizabeth's death and any suspects is unwise, potentially damaging to them, and they can't condone it. We'll have to leave it to you, 
the listener, to ultimately decide whether or not this series traffics in speculation and innuendo. Ruth and I hold ourselves to the highest possible journalistic and ethical standards. There are plenty of other true crime podcasts where you can get gossip and wild theories, but our hope at least is that this will not be one of them. Anyone who wants to talk to us, on or off the record, is welcome to reach out. And anyone with information about the case should contact the Creve Court Police Department, which still considers this an open murder investigation. I love the tagline for David Fincher's version of The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. What is hidden in snow comes forth in the thaw. Like other issues in the American Evangelical Church, the snow is starting to melt around this story. And we feel like we're in the right place at the right time to tell it. I won't get into it now because my faith journey is complicated, but I can say without any hesitation that I have been called to this project. And I don't know exactly where it's going. A lot will depend on who's willing to come forward to tell us their stories or who gets pressured into not speaking. As you've already heard, there are some people who are very upset that we're making this series and they're gambling that it's gonna be forgotten in a month after no one hears it. I guess that remains to be seen. One last housekeeping note. You'll notice that episodes one and two both released on the same day. To start the series off, we wanted listeners to hear the overview of the story and also start to hear the details of the murder itself. But going forward, we'll be releasing one new episode every other Tuesday. So episode three will come out on January 2nd. True Believer is written recorded, edited, mixed, and executive produced by T.J. Ingracia. Co-written and co-produced by Ruth Servan-Smith. Research and development by Kyle Hackman and Doug Servan. Visit truebeliverpodcast.com to see additional materials related to each episode or to get in touch with us. If you're someone who knew Elizabeth or have any other information that you think we need to know, we'd love to hear from you. Next time on True Believer. A young man came running in, very distraught, and said, Dr. Van Groningen, please come. Something has happened in the bathroom. We weren't given any more details, but there is a lady laying on the ground. As you can tell, there's quite a bit of blood. Source of the blood being determined at two small holes in the throat. I've taken on a couple different murders, but hers seemed to be the most brutal. Whoa, what's going on here? Something has happened. I don't... Police cars. Police cars, and it was not the usual Monday morning routine. What was substantial was the main suspect (laughs) being mad at her.